sure you already know by now that we are the Knoxville History Project and our mission is to research, preserve and promote the history and culture of Knoxville, Tennessee. And tonight, uh, Jack is going to be in conversation and introducing uh, Theodis Robinson. So we are thrilled that Mr. Robinson is here this evening. And Jack, I'm going to hand, hand it over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. And thanks, uh, Nicole, who's uh, donating uh, an, an hour of her vacation in Florida to help us uh, with this, because I'm not sure we could figure out how to do it if she if she didn't. So we appreciate her help. Um, but uh, we're uh, much honored tonight to have a living legend uh, with us uh, this evening. Uh, uh, Mr. Theodos Robinson. Uh, his, uh, he's been well known in the newspapers in Knoxville since uh, about 1960 when he, uh, his application to the University of Tennessee caused quite a stir, uh, which led to him being one of the first three African-American students to be admitted to uh, University of Tennessee as undergraduates. Uh, he was later, of course, uh, a vice president at, at UT, uh, but in the middle, he was a uh, notable uh, politician, a, a local statesman, I should say, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, ran for uh, uh, state legislature in 1968, I believe, but about, about that time right. also became one of the first um, newspaper columnists. Uh, I like to mention this as a former newspaper columnist, columnist myself, one of the first black newspaper columnists in Knoxville history, maybe the first, uh, and he had a column for about a year at that time, and then uh, uh, several years later, he, he renewed it a bit. Um, but uh, his, uh, he, he's talking tonight mainly about the 1970s, the time that he was in city council. And when we think about the civil rights era, we often concentrate mainly on the early 60s. And he was there then and was part of that. But he, uh, the 1970s was when many of, many of these uh, uh, dramatic changes were implemented in a lot of different ways. And, and he was involved in that and also in other things uh, that helped both his community and Knoxville. Um, he was, uh, it, but his uh, talking about the 1970s brings up the fact that this is kind of a shadow in American history and also in my perception. I have to say, I have, uh, I've been a reporter in Knoxville since the early 1990s and Noah wrote some in the 1980s too. But, uh, and when I talk about history, I, I usually talk about the history that I don't remember. That's when I do my research. So I have not looked into the 1970s as much as I should have. So uh, uh, Mr. Robinson is, is helping us a great deal fill in this gap. We have a, a, a kind of a gap and it's kind of a shadow in our culture. We tend to concentrate either on the very new or the, or the old enough to have forgotten about a little bit uh, and sometimes don't get into this, this kind of shadow part of our culture. And it kind of uh, is reflected in the fact that our uh, photograph collection, our Nostal shoebox, we have more photographs from 100 years ago than we do of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, are hoping to rectify that somehow, uh, looking at Nostal, but also to tell the story of the uh, of the 1970s. Um, but uh, but uh, the Theodos Robinson, I don't know how many people know this, but when he was elected to city council, began serving in 1970, he was the first black person to have held uh, a, a, an elected office at city council since 1912. Uh, and uh, why this is, uh, there, were a lot, there was a lot of uh, African-American participation in city council for a period from about 1869 to 1912, uh, uh, more than a dozen people, uh, black people served in city council during that time. Some of them, and, and, and one year we had three black city councilmen in the 1880s. But something happened in the 20th century. Things didn't all get better. Some things got worse before they got better, in terms of uh, in terms of representation. And uh, and 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 Theotis was there right when they began getting better again the second time uh, for full participation in city council. But he was elected in 1970, and we'll be talking ma mainly about the things that were going on at that time. And Theotis, uh, let let us know. I don't know if you want to talk at all about anything before this time. Talk about your your youth in Knoxville, uh, you're certainly welcome to at this point if you want to. Your your father was uh, was in the restaurant business, wasn't he, in East Knoxville? Yes, he was, Jack. And thank you for having me this evening. Let me go back to those years prior to when I was elected between 1912 and 1970. Up until 1912, members of city council or the Board of Aldermen or whatever titles they happened to have, where they were elected solely from districts. But then 
at, as the whole reconstruction across the South uh, began to be pushed back. One way to get rid of representation from the black community was to eliminate the districts and make everyone run at large. And because of that, that was why people were pushed back and could not uh, win election. The city recognized because uh, after so many decades, a number of lawsuits were filed across the South. A very important one was filed in Alabama about one man, one vote. And the Supreme Court had ruled one man, one vote. And cities began to lose uh, court fights uh, over the fact that Black people could not win election, uh, uh, you know, running at large. The city of Knoxville recognized that inevitabilities of such a lawsuit come in here. And so they changed uh, the way uh, members of city council, as well as the Knoxville City Board of Education, we no longer have a city school system that was uh, dissolved and the county took over uh, education in schools uh, throughout the county, including the city. And so that went on referendum in 1968 in that fall election when I was running for the state legislature. It passed uh, to change the charter to set up six districts with three at-large seats. And uh, ultimately, that, that same night when I was losing the legislative race, the, the uh, charter was changed and we were meeting at Bob Booker's house. A number of us who, had, Bob and I were both running for the state legislature in adjoining districts. And the decision was made that I would run for city council that uh, following year. So, yeah. yes. How about that? How about that? Was this something you had thought about doing when you were a student at UT? Did had you ever thought about getting into politics? Oh, way beyond when I was a student at UT. My mm -hmm. first political remember uh, my first political memory dates back to 1948 presidential <laughs> election when I was sitting with my mom listening to the election returns on the radio. It was pre-television, at least pre-widespread television. Yeah, and, and, and that, uh, was, listen, that was one of the closest elections in American history, uh, Truman versus Dewey, right? Oh, yes, oh. when the Chicago Tribune had yeah. big headlines, uh, Dewey uh, wins or Truman loses, whichever way they had yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and had to retract. But I followed, followed I was, uh, at that point, I was six years old. And I followed politics from the time I was six until today, and I'll still be following it tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. Mm -hmm. So it's been in my blood all my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, did you have a, a, an idea of, a, of an agenda when you, uh, when you were ran for city council and when you came into, uh, to, to, when you got your seat there? Yes. There were many things that had gone on. Well, for example, I'll use this as an example. During 1960, during the summer when the uh, lunch counter sit-ins were going on, in July, the sit-ins had begun in uh, June of 1960. Mm -hmm. And in July, the organization that was sponsoring the sit-ins took out an ad in the Sunday edition of the Knoxville New Sentinel. I think it was July 22nd, but I'm not certain on that date. They listed a number of things that were wrong here in the city of Knoxville. One, of course, was that the University of Tennessee did not admit, admit, quote, Negroes to the undergraduate school. But one of the things they had in that list of things was the fact that the Knoxville Police Department had had Black police officers since back in the 30s, but none of them held rank above patrolmen. And yet all of them that were currently serving had four-year college degrees, whereas their white counterparts, for the most part, had no college. And so I saw that as a problem. That was, that was the first thing that I tackled when I got on city council. Yeah, yeah, to, to get, to elevate uh, patrolmen to, uh, to more, more officer status, I guess, right? Correct. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, were you successful with that? And, and what, how, how were you greeted by the city councilman? I'm trying to think Kaz Walker was still on city council at the time, wasn't he? How, how did the other councilman of the time uh, uh, accept you? Well, Kaz Walker sat on my immediate right. Yeah. And just beyond him was Kyle Testament. And oh, wow. uh, that got to be very interesting because <laughs> Kyle and I would distract Kaz when a vote was being called. And then when they uh, asked for his vote, we would tell him vote yes on something we knew he was opposed to. <laughs> and he was but opposed to almost, almost everything, wasn't he? Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> but uh, I, I was greeted uh, uh, well. Of course, I'd met a number of these people on the campaign trail. Uh, just like Kyle and I had uh, become acquainted uh, during the campaign. And uh, my reception was fine. No problems with that. Yeah, okay, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. But how, how did, how it was uh, that the police, uh, how did you oh, phrase yeah. that uh, as a motion? Well, what happened, back then, the city budget ran from January 1 through December 31st. That has since been changed to a, a July 1st, June 30 uh, budget year. So I was sworn into office on January 1st, and the first thing on the agenda was to approve a budget. <clears throat> the previous year, 1969, the city had run a deficit uh, on their spending. The reason being that the uniform bodies, policemen and firemen, all wanted pay raises, and the mayor at the time was Leonard Rogers. Leonard said that the funds were not there to pay for a pay increase. Kaz Walker took the position that they were there, that Leonard just did not want to spend the money. And Leonard warned that the city would end up running a, a deficit, which it did. Under city charter, it capped the property tax rate. I don't remember what that number was, but it was capped. It could not rise above that except if the city ran a deficit, then you could, in the previous year, you could raise the tax rate by just enough to cover that deficit to wipe it out. So Leonard, of course, was proposing a uh, nickel tax increase, I think it was, to take care of that deficit. Well, Kaz was very much opposed to that. And when it came up on first reading, Kaz was in the hospital. But Kaz had a block of uh, council members that were four who voted, uh, three who voted with him. And then there were four, so that, that was a block of four. And then there were four, uh, or three really, no, I'm sorry, four, who tended to support the mayor. And then there was me. So on the first reading, I chose, I took, I took the position that I had nothing to do with creating a deficit. So why should I be called upon to raise taxes to wipe out a deficit that I did not create? And I voted no. Well, it ended up in a 4-4 tie and Leonard Rogers cast the tie-breaking vote, but it had to come back on second reading. <clears throat> Kaz issued a public statement that if they had to roll him into the city council meeting on a gurney, he'd be there to vote down this unnecessary tax increase which told Leonard Rogers that he had to have my vote. So he arranged a meeting uh, with, a, uh, Kyle was present. I forget the gentleman who was over patronage uh, under Leonard's administration and myself. And he wanted to know what would it take to get me from a no to a yes. And I laid out that I wanted five promotions in the police department I wanted a captain, two lieutenants, and two sergeants. And I wanted five promotions in the fire department where uh, men, black men, were simply firemen. There were no drivers, no any of the specialties that they had. Leonard agreed to that. And so at the next meeting, I said, in order for the city, you know, I voted no the first time. But if the city is to continue to progress and do the things for the citizens here in Knoxville who elected us, uh, I had to vote yes. Georgiana Vines, who was reporting for the new Sentinel on city council and politics. And, and, and to who's me, here tonight, I should say. She, oh, she's, okay. she's joining us tonight. Okay. She asked me, well, she had heard the rumors. Yeah, I checked in on you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Georgiana. Uh, she had heard the rumors that the deal had been cut. And so she approached me to want 
to ask if that was true or not. And I said, oh, no, that's not the case. I voted my conscience on this. And I think two days later, Leonard promoted these 10 men. <laughs> that, that was the first victory and the first uh, impactful thing that I got accomplished on city council. Well, that's that's a great story. That's pretty impactful. I, I, I appreciate your, your reminding us of that. Uh, what else was, was going on? A lot of things were changing on a lot of uh, levels at that time. And uh, Urban Renewal was uh, was still going on. Uh, did you have to, have to deal with that? that? That was kind of the very last chapter of it, I guess, during your, your time there. Yes, it was. Uh, in, in the context of massive urban renewal programs, they've since had things like the Hope Six pro Project in Mechanicsville, that uh, took out the old college homes and then later uh, Austin homes. But uh, it was being worked on at that point that uh, a Morningside Urban Renewal Program. All the previous urban renewal programs, the people would come in and assess the property uh, in terms of its value. And the property owners were simply paid that assessed value. Well, of course, if it's in a, an urban, if the area is deemed uh, urban renewal worthy, that, that is going to mean that the value of the properties are really depressed because the homes are often very run down and what have you. But the money that uh, homeowners were being paid uh, was not enough to go out and purchase a new home. This program, the Morningside Urban Renewal Program, fixed that problem. Homeowners were paid whatever the assessed value was, but I, let's say uh, that the house that they were living in was assessed to be worth $10,000, but a standard house uh, to meet their family needs, let's say it's a family of four, a husband and a wife, a son and a daughter, so they needed a three bedroom house. We did a survey of Knoxville uh, real estate values and, and cost and determined what a standard house, a three bedroom, uh, well, first of all, a two bedroom, a three bedroom, and a four bedroom home would cost a standard house in the Knoxville market and found that, for example, with the uh, family of four, a standard house would cost $25,000. Well, that homeowner, that property owner is $15,000 short. So the Morningside Urban Renewal Project had with it a grant program up to $25,000. And that was tapped to make up the difference between what your house was assessed for and what it would take you to buy a standard house in the Knoxville market. And so families were able to make that uh, leap to a higher value property, increased wealth really in a given family uh, because these were grants. Uh, for some families, uh, there was also low income loans. If, it, if that bridge money was not enough to get you there, you could borrow whatever was uh, left over. Then a number of homes were not taken uh, down. Uh, they were uh, renovated and, and there was money to pay for that. Uh, this program created some 200 standard brick houses in the Morningside area. You can see them there uh, now. And they were designed for families who had been, uh, whose property had been taken and those who lived in public housing to be able to buy. Well, all of those 200 houses long since were bought and many resold two or three times uh, since 19, mid 1970s. It also built a couple of senior citizen uh, facilities for housing, the Isabella Towers, as well as the apartments on Linden Avenue and created, of course, the Bird Sanctuary uh, it's, uh, there uh, right off of uh, Hill Avenue. So it was a very different program. We went through hearings for uh, a full year, maybe two, attended I don't know how many public hearings. And when it came down the night of the vote, city council was fairly split on this because we had a, people that had such bad experiences with urban renewal, they were just really afraid of what was going to happen. They didn't trust 
what they were being told about grants being available and low interest loans for both purchasing your home and uh, housing renovation. And uh, two members of city council, Bernice O'Connor and Eugene Turner Jr. approached me and said that they had sat through all of these hearings, they had heard the pros and the cons on whether or not this project should go forward and they could go either way. But since it was my district, these were my people that whatever I did, that's what they would do. So that automatically meant that my one vote became three votes. Mm -hmm. I voted in, in the affirmative, so did they, and it passed six to three to approve the Morningside Urban Renewal Project. If I had gone the other way, it would have been defeated six to three. Mm -hmm. Wow, how about that? And that Morningside is is uh, what uh, where we now know is that where Haley Heritage Square is and where the yes. Alex Haley statue is and all that right off of uh, Dandridge Avenue there. Um, but uh, there were other uh, other proposals that called might have called for massive uh, moving people out of their homes uh, too that uh, that were very different. Uh, one was uh, it was called the uh, with Walker Springs Connector I think it was called Cherry Street, uh, Cherry Street Connector. Yeah, well, yeah, that, and that was part of what was called a walker. It was part of a big, long thing, but yeah. Uh, but you were, tell us about what you remember about that and how it was, uh, uh, it would have, would have, would have affected your, your constituents there. Well, you know, we do not live in vacuums. We come to the table making decisions with a whole lifetime of experiences and observations of things that have happened in other places as well as within our own community. Mm -hmm. In Nashville, when they were constructing I-40 Highway, uh, part of Eisenhower's uh, plan to build interstate highways throughout the nation, I-40 was routed through a section of Nashville, which was around Fisk University and Tennessee State University and where uh, black populations live. They brought that interstate through that commun those communities and just utterly destroyed uh, those communities. Uh, it cut off streets, dead ended a number of streets. Uh, uh, ingress and egress was much more complicated and people really complained highly about the impacts, the negative impacts that bring in I-40 through those neighborhoods had had on their communities. The Cherry Street Connector was coming from Cecil Avenue all the way uh, on Cherry Street. It was supposed to cross Magnolia Avenue and continue south and tie in to the uh, uh, that bridge that goes across into South Knoxville. That meant it was, in, in East Knoxville, the traffic patterns run east-west. They don't run north-south. They run east and west. But this highway was going, it was going to be a, a, a four-lane divided highway running north and south. Would have cut off every street in East Knoxville and would have had a very negative impact on, on the families who lived in that community. And so by this time, I'd earned enough capital, cap political capital with my fellow council members that they would they listen uh, when I would point out certain things. And so I was able to stop the Cherry Street Connector. If you go out there on Magnolia now, on the north side, you see uh, four lanes and divided come into Magnolia. And then just as it crosses Magnolia, it, it narrows down and become just a regular two-lane street. And so the uh, neighborhoods in East Knoxville were not negatively impacted like they were in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, something I have to admit I did not know about until you mentioned it the other day. And I, uh, we actually found a, a map of what they were planning, uh, but that would have been devastating. And uh, as, much as, uh, as much as we've lost a highways uh, over the years, as much as our city we've lost, here's a here, there's that map of of Knoxville, and you see that uh, that uh, that dotted line, right? Uh, it, yes. It was, uh, is is where what it would have would have would have been going to where 
I guess where the, is that the South Bustle Bridge where it is now or? Yes. Uh, but, uh, but that would have been, that would have been really devastating. Uh, to, it would have divided, uh, divided East, East Knoxville against it, apart, you know, apart from itself in a way. One of the funnier aspects of that, uh, Milton Roberts, who was on the city council, was all in favor of building uh, this extension of Cherry Street to hook into the South Knoxville Bridge. He was all in favor of that. So I pulled Milton aside and said, I tell you what, Milton, why don't we just reroute it? So rather than going through East Knoxville, we'll just take it through Holston Hills where you live. And uh, that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, that was a good strategy, uh, uh, I would say. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, well, thanks for, for explaining that. Uh, I appreciate it. What, a lot of other things were going on in the 70s. Uh, anything else you want to talk about in terms of, uh, of what you did? I, I want to save uh, the big proposal about the uh, Second Creek Valley for a little bit later, but uh, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about before we get to get to that? Uh, something, to, oh, uh, there was something else that crossed my mind and at 80 years old, <laughs> thoughts can be fleeting. <laughs> Yeah. And this sort of simply escape. But we had a one of the things that I set out to do uh, when I won election. The city of Knoxville has various boards, uh, authorities um, that oversee different aspects of government. Uh, for example, the Civil Service Board or the KUB Board or the Airport Authority, uh, mm -hmm. these kinds of bodies that are nominated by the mayor and confirmed or rejected by city council. When I went on the city council, there was only one board that had an African-American on its body. And that was the old Knoxville Housing Authority, today KCDC. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to accomplish was to get people in various uh, boards and authorities and commissions uh, to look out for the interest of the uh, community that I represented. Some of those were very easy, like the, the first one that came up was the library board. And Marilyn Rogers uh, nominated a man whom I had known all my life. Matter of fact, his wife had been my first grade teacher. But there was some, but he had no background as far as libraries uh, were concerned. And I knew someone else who had a master's degree in library science. And that's who I wanted on there. So I, was, I had to move to reject uh, the mayor's appointment. I had to explain that uh, to this gentleman whom I had great respect for, uh, but I got to my nominee, uh, the person that I favored through and appointed. And after that, there was consultation before folk uh, came forward, nominated somebody. The one that was the most difficult was, well, the two that were the most difficult was the KUB board. First time, uh, because they had a self-perpetuating board, they had like 12 year terms. And when the term was up, then they would renominate that same person whose term had just expired. It was difficult to break, but, um, First time I tried to change the KUB board, uh, I was the only one who voted no. Then time passed and other boards came up and my case was being, uh, the case I was making began to sink in with my fellow council members. The next time one came up, uh, they were confirmed. This time it was on a six to three vote. I got two people to go with me. The third time uh, it came up, I was able to block uh, the person who had been nominated and put forth the name of uh, Bob Kirk, uh, who was the first black tenure professor at UT. And he was confirmed and served on the KUB board for a number of years and subsequently uh, served on, there was a group of utility boards in the Southeast and he chaired that group. So getting people, getting representation on these different boards, commissions and authorities was one of my agenda items that I wanted to accomplish, and I got that done. Yeah, I'm glad glad you did. That that's uh, a, quite a lot of accomplishments. But there's one more I remembered that we uh, we talked about a bit uh, earlier. 
Uh, and that was the fact that a lot of people may not know this, but uh, Austin East High School did not have its own its own stadium uh, at uh, at that time, did it? No, they, it they, did not. They were over at Evans Collins Field, which was in uh, Caswell Park, which was near next to Bill Maher Stadium over there in uh, in, in East Knoxville. But it, but that's several blocks away from uh, from the high school. Uh, tell us about how that happened. A number of schools didn't have stadiums. Some did, some didn't. Fulton High School had a stadium, but many other schools did not have stadiums. First time it came up, came the matter came up to vote to approve the building of a uh, football stadium next to a school. I pointed out that Austin East did not have a stadium next to it on its uh, uh, campus, and that I would like to see that happen. But I go ahead and vote for the funding because all of the Board of Education uh, funding had to be approved by city council. Second time they came in and uh, it was not Austin East again. And I told them I will vote for this one, but the next one had best be Austin East, which it was. So we got the Austin East Stadium built. It was a uh, uh, name for a, a gentleman whom I had known since I was a kid. And so that one, that was another one that got accomplished. There was uh, the year before I got elected, there was a $100,000 recreational bond issue for parks and playgrounds. Out of that 100,000, I think 5,000 was spent in the black community, which is far below uh, the need and the representation in the population uh, here in Knoxville. And so when I got on city council, uh, I pressured uh, the mayor, Linda Rogers, uh, about building a playground in the Mechanicsville area. So uh, we got that done and, and named it uh, Malcolm Martin Park, and it was built by a black contractor, Tommy Moore. Uh, it was named for Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, wasn't it? Yes, it yeah. was. Yeah, Malcolm yeah. Martin Park and built yeah. by Tommy Moore. Yeah, well, it was great accomplishments. And of course, uh, Austin East has, a, uh, has often a champion football team that plays in that, uh, in that stadium. Um, but there was another proposal that came, uh, I guess, your third or fourth year in, uh, in city council from someone who just come back from Spokane, Washington and said, why don't we, uh, why don't we have a World's Fair? And, uh, and that was uh, the beginning of, uh, of kind of the surprising beginning of, of something that uh, developed over several years and something we're remembering this year. Uh, tell us about uh, wh when you first heard of that and how you got involved. What happened, I, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name, uh, but he had been at a uh, conference in Oklahoma City. And one of the speakers at that conference was a man named, with the improbable name of King Cole. King had been president of the Spokane Fair uh, that had occurred a few years prior to this conference. And he was talking about what a great economic driver a World's Fair can be for a community. Some people in Knoxville, uh, when he came back, he started spreading the story and was uh, really advocating that Knoxville needed to explore this. Uh, there, an interest developed uh, and, and it began to uh, grow legs and, and move forward. Was, was this Stuart Evans by any chance? Stuart so, Evans, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, he that's was the a... gentleman. He was a retired Air Force colonel uh, who at the time was the head of the downtown organization, downtown uh, promotion association, but he was yes. the guy who first proposed this. Yes, he, according to him, he flew bombers in World War II in Europe. Yeah. But uh, yes, it, it, his idea, uh, like I said, it grew legs and took off running. Well, as time went by, momentum gained and more concrete proposals uh, for doing the World's Fair came forth, but so did the op opposition uh, to a fair. There was a man named Joe Dodd, Dr. Joe Dodd, who was a professor in the political science department at UT. And he was adamantly opposed. Uh, and he would throw stuff out there. For example, one of the, one of the things that he said, and it, he said that 
Knoxville did not need to have a World's Fair uh, because, because if you look at Spokane, the incidence of rape in Spokane increased 100% during the year that they had a World's Fair over the year prior. And he was right. It went from one rape to two. But he used that number. You know, they talk about uh, liars lie and statisticians, yeah, <laughs> I guess, yeah. lie to something along those lines. That was a great example of that. Uh, one, that uh, yeah. one, 100% increase. Yes, one yeah. to two, that's 100%. Yeah. And so Joe and others were trying to force a referendum because the city had to approve uh, uh, bonds to purchase the land down in the valley uh, there behind l &N and all along that corridor that later became the World's Fair, that is today the World's Fair site. And they were really pushing hard uh, for a referendum. Well, a referendum would have done two things uh, right away. It would cost a lot of money to uh, advocate uh, for voters to approve this and time, uh, because there was a time factor as far as when we were gonna get this thing done. Well, my governing philosophy is that people elect folk to office to make decisions that, and to pay attention and look out for their best interest and to make important decisions uh, that they don't have the time to spend to research and stay on top of. And, um, you know, if you are doing that as a, a member of an elected political body, then you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. If you take every issue to a referendum, government would be tied up in knots and you never get anything done. Well, the matter came uh, before city council, as I said, the chamber was filled up, the old ballroom at the Knoxville uh, uh, Auditorium Convention Center there on what is now Howard Baker, was Church Street when I was a kid. And someone made a motion uh, that it be put before the public to uh, decide. Someone else made a, a, uh, offered a second, and I offered a motion uh, to table, and someone seconded that. And they wanted to go ahead with the vote on the original motion, and I insisted and called on the law director to rule a table. A motion to table kills debate and stops any action. And the law director uh, agreed with that, uh, with my point of view and what I was saying. And so we forestalled having a referendum, which really would have killed the World's Fair. Yeah, yeah. Did you like the idea from the beginning? You... Well, to me, if you're living in a, in a place and nothing is happening, then nobody has a chance to move forward or, or, or grow economically or gain uh, economically. Certainly those who are trying to find ways up don't have. The fair offered a real opportunity uh, for some economic growth as well as certain infrastructure developments, the interstate highway system and the old infamous uh, uh, spaghetti junction uh, out there on, on I-40, things like that that could be addressed, as well as clearing out an area that was begging some kind of development. Uh, I regret that uh, it did not move forward uh, as after the fair, as far as the World's Fair site is concerned, economically. There were some plans that came forward to redevelop that site uh, but because of politics and animus, uh, it never happened to redevelop the World's Fair site so that uh, you have a lot, of, lot more activity going on, and e economic uh, activity going on there. But yes, I thought it offered great opportunities to Knoxville. Yeah, well, I have to say, I think it took a lot longer than we expected. Well, we now we have the Knoxville Museum of Art, I have the STEM Academy, we have, uh, you have uh, the condominiums at the county factory a lot of things it took it did it did take a, a decade or more to start 
stirring, but it, it uh, we did a program a few months ago about the World's Fair Park and how it's uh, how it's it's uh, kind of grown into something different, but I think very valuable for the city today. But you were involved in the World's Fair itself, weren't you? Uh, you were a vice president, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and were uh, involved in in getting some of the uh, one of the most uh, memorable exhibits uh, together there. Yes, I was vice president of economic development, uh, which really meant that I was uh, there seeking to find opportunities uh, for black business people uh, and firms and companies to really participate uh, in the World's Fair activity. Uh, I wrote the policy uh, for the World's Fair in terms of black inclusion in the financial benefits, economic benefits for the fair. And the uh, centerpiece of that was that African-Americans uh, would uh, should gain 14 to 20% of all the economic activity. And so that started off with the uh, design of the fair itself. There's, we identified a black architectural firm decades old out of Nashville, McKissick and McKissick. And they designed two or three, they did the uh, design and wrote the blueprints for uh, a couple of uh, pavilions at the World's Fair site. Then those things had to be built. And we did not have a black contractor uh, with the capacity, uh, the financial capacity or the technical capacity to do this. So what we did, uh, we put together a joint venture or a, um, oh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, where we brought uh, a couple of firms together. Normally you have in those kinds of deals, a large white contractor and a much smaller black contract, a joint venture uh, to undertake a project. But we put together two black contractors, uh, the aforementioned Tommy Moore, as well as Felix Gator. Tommy had more financial capacity. Felix had more hands-on experience on uh, building a site. Even so, they did not have, uh, the, Tommy didn't have the financial capacity to do the jobs that uh, were before him. And so this was a private, uh, Knoxville International Energy Exposition was a private nonprofit corporation. It's different than the city of Knoxville or the county of Knox or even the state of Tennessee in terms of what it can do. So what we did, knowing that they did not have that financial capacity, uh, the Mexican pavilion was one of the pavilions that they built. Rather than uh, take that whole project on at, in its whole, we broke that project up into three phases so that they could bond the prep work, the groundwork that they had to do before they did anything else, bonded that, they completed that work, we inspected it and then released that bond into the next phase, uh, phase two. They did that, we inspected it, accepted it, and then they moved that bond into uh, stage three. So we were able to get black contractors in, they built uh, that one in the Philippines pavilion and then we brought in some black contractors, another one to do restrooms and yet another contractor to do the curbing. Well, you also have uh, all of the, um, concession operations. So we put together a couple of, a couple of uh, groups. Uh, one group, we, uh, raised, we raised $100,000 in $1980, which today would uh, be what, half a million dollars, I guess. And that group operated a fried chicken stand that was very popular, a lot of visits to that stand. And the second group we brought together, uh, we I uh, brought in $75,000 in investment from uh, Knoxville's black community, and they operated an ice cream stand and a funnel cake operation. And then a gentleman from Dallas, Texas came in and did a uh, New Orleans style food concession. And then there are a couple of other men who had uh, operated concessions on their own. And then when the fair was over, we brought in a black demolition contractor to take down the site. So we found that kind of involvement and the way 
the, the thing that sold uh, Bo Roberts, uh, who was president, and the uh, other people who were driving this, I pointed out what had happened in the hemisphere in San Antonio. San Antonio has a very large Latinx population. But when they planned their World's Fair, they did not reach out to that community to include them in the economic benefits that were going to accrue from the fair. So guess what? When they opened the gates, guess who didn't show up at the fair? The Latinx community. They stayed at home because they were non-participants in that. And the Hemisphere Fair lost his shirt. They lost goo gobs of money. New Orleans did the very same thing. and <laughs> They lost their shirt. But the Knoxville Fair ended uh, in the black. Yeah. You know, one, I, I was impressed. I did some research uh, a couple months ago for a project we did. Uh, uh, and uh, I was impressed. I, I found an old article in Black Enterprise Magazine, which is a national mm -hmm. magazine. And they were talking about the World's Fair. And they were impressed with the degree of African-American involvement in, in the fair. And they were mentioning in particular uh, the T-shirt the vendors, that most of the T-shirts were, were, were actually manufactured by a Black firm. Uh, yes, and, yes. Uh, but also, they uh, they talked about the exhibit at the lifestyle and uh, lifestyle and technology center of African American culture, and they and they they said that this is the biggest, uh, the best, biggest and best African American culture exhibit that's ever been at an American World's Fair. Uh, and I, I don't know how many people remember it. I remember it, uh, but it was it was uh, it was inside, and you went in and uh, have, tell us what you remember about that and how that worked. Now that was a. Uh... That exhibit, we, initially we wanted a full pavilion, but the financing simply was not there. So we developed this exhibit in the, uh, uh, that area downstairs, the, exhibit, the big exhibit hall. They had a number of things in it, like the world's biggest bed uh, was one of the exhibit items down there. Uh, we contracted with a gentleman out of uh, New York uh, who had worked on world's fairs uh, for a number of uh, a, a number of different world's fairs, and he was very interested in doing uh, this kind of a uh, uh, exhibit that highlighted uh, black achievements. And so, it, being an energy fair, we talked about the energy of black folk uh, in developing this country, and uh, it was narrated by James Earl Jones. It sounded like the voice of God uh, <laughs> yeah. carrying forth the narration because he has a, everybody can, can, when they hear that voice, they know, they know who it is, speaks with great authority. One of the lines in the presentation was, because he talked about how with farming, uh, the uh, farming in the South, the farmers were really wearing out the soil they did not uh, understand crop rotation in order to uh, not deplete the soil of the nutrients that certain plants needed more than other uh, nutrients. And uh, he talked about the labor, the slave labor that had gone into this country to build it. And he concluded, he concluded with a line that said, in fact, African-Americans have done more to make this country great than any other people. Well, I got a phone call from a reporter for the New Yorker who wanted to know about that controversial comment uh, that was in the presentation. And he and I talked for a moment and said, well, think about it. What other uh, group of people gave were required to give 200 years of unpaid labor to develop this country? Well, that was the end of that conversation. No article ever appeared because he was planning on blasting us over that. That didn't happen. <laughs> but there are a number of stories out of the fair. One, some of them were really funny. Uh, one of the things that I was seeking to do was to invite African countries to the fair. And I made uh, a couple of trips uh, to Africa uh, and I went to Washington. Uh, I sat down with uh, uh, Andrew Young, this was after uh, Jimmy Carter had dismissed him as the ambassador to, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. after he, it, 
uh, came known that he had established back channel to uh, uh, Yasser Arafat, and it was political dynamite uh, for Carter. But uh, uh, Young uh, was planning on hosting a cruise down the Potomac uh, for African ambassadors and invited me to come to Washington for that event. Well, I'm all over that when there was a flight out of Knoxville. United had a direct flight then that left Knoxville around 4.30, a quarter to five, that would get me to Washington in time to uh, check in the hotel change and get down to where the uh, boat was going to be leaving. But in the World Spirit, there were so many times we were just busy as all get up with that uh, one arm paper hanger. That's what we were. We were making this stuff up as we went because there is no blueprint to how do you do a World Fair. On this particular day, I ended up missing my flight uh, to Washington uh, uh, to be on this cruise where I could meet and converse uh, with these ambassadors in a more, much more casual situation. And I got chewed out, not because I missed the flight, but because I didn't have the good sense to charter a plane and go after I'd missed the flight. Now, how many times have any of, any of us been chewed out for not chartering a plane when we missed the flight? <laughs> but uh, I met with a number of these ambassadors, got to know some of them pretty well, and we did a two-day, uh, what I call dog and pony show here in Knoxville. We invited them to Knoxville. And there are a couple of stories around that that were really funny. Uh, one of the gentlemen I met uh, was the ambassador from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. He and I had become pretty good friends. So to the point that when I would go to Washington, I'd call uh, the embassy and he would dispatch his driver and his limousine to take me wherever I wanted to go around the city. Well, we had a problem. He brought with him two of his wives. What are the seating arrangements at dinner for a man and two of his wives? You know, you've got to figure this stuff, this stuff out on the fly. But after the dinner was over, uh, we retired to uh, Avon Rollins' house. Avon, in anticipation of the fair, had added a great room onto his house, uh, brand new, brand new carpet, what have you. And for this occasion, he brought out his best liquor. One of the bottles was a fifth of uh, Jack Daniels Black that the ambassador from Cote d'Ivoire liked. In Africa, the custom is when you open, you break the seal on a new bottle of spirits, you pour some on the ground for your ancestors to partake. So the ambassador broke the seal on this bottle of Jack Daniels Black and proceeded to pour some of that into Avon's carpet. I thought Avon was going to have a stroke <laughs> standing there looking at that. That was hilarious. <laughs> there are lots of stories like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's wonderful. Well, I uh, really appreciate your, your time with us, uh, uh, Theotis. The, uh, uh, we have a, Paul prepared a kind of a collage of pictures of, 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 of the, your era, at least, in uh, city council. And it's, it, some of them are great pictures, but it kind of points out that we don't have as many pictures of the 70s that we, as we would uh, like to have. And, uh, but we like to show pictures at these events. So we're going to show uh, the, the photos we have. Uh, some of which you've seen briefly. Of course, the 70s opened with uh, the uh, 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 famous uh, and dramatic, nationally dramatic uh, Billy Graham and Richard Nixon uh, event at Neyland Stadium, which was greeted by a, uh, a, a small riot uh, in the stands. There's a funny story around Billy Graham. Um, I was on city council at that point, and one of the mayor's assistants came to all of us there was going to be one night where the mayor and uh, members of city council could sit on the podium uh, with Billy Graham. And uh, we all have tickets uh, for that. And any other nights that we wanted to attend, we had tickets right down front in the front row. And so the mayor's assistant asked me, how many tickets and what nights do you want to go? I said, well, uh, really, I don't want any. I do not plan to go to this political rally 
uh, disguised as some kind of a religious event. And he looked at me, he was uh, stunned that I would be turning down tickets to go see Billy Graham. And it's so, so funny that right, you mentioned several of the people who were involved in that it worked in my political campaign. <laughs> so, oh. Well, yeah, it was a dramatic day, that's for sure. I, I don't know, how, I forgot how many uh, dozens of people were arrested uh, in the, in the mm -hmm. stands that day. Uh, th this got uh, a lot of national attention. This was the one of the biggest demonstrations in the South uh, during the uh, kind of the counterculture era, and uh, mm -hmm. got a lot of a lot of attention. Uh, oh yes, yeah. This is of course uh, this uh, probably two years later the opening of West Town Mall, uh, the first big uh, covered shopping mall in the in the city, uh, and. I spent quite a lot of time there, and mainly just looking at records. But um, in, the, in those days, uh, next it's one. one of, it's one of the last survivors of malls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of people forget that this this area was was partly vacant. Uh, this was, I think, being used as an appliance warehouse. This the old uh, Sullivan Saloon. This is one of the earliest photographs I've ever seen of the Sullivan Saloon. It's surprising how few old photographs there are of it. Uh, but this was taken by our friend Ross Mall, who was worked for the army at the time and was just wandering around taking pictures of uh, interesting parts of town that were mostly neglected. And the old camel tent uh, business was there on the mm -hmm. side in those days. That was one of the few businesses that were uh, still open down there. Next one. Yes, I, I remember all of that. Yeah. Next one. And yeah, and here's just up the up the street on Jackson Avenue. And you see an old pacer there. That shows you what <laughs> what what era that was. I haven't seen a pacer in thirty five years, probably. <laughs> yeah, all of that has been repurposed. And here's mm. a picture of the Otis in the in the. You, you got in the paper a lot in those days. I I just did a kind of quick scan, and you you were you were making your voice known quite quite a lot through the through the seventies. No, I think when I was elected to city council, I became the second youngest person ever elected uh, to city council. I was elect elected in 69, mm -hmm. and so I was 27 years old, and I was 27 when I was sworn into office. How about and, that? Uh, yeah, the second youngest ever. How about that? And I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we all had more than we do now. All right, and here's... Uh, the Knox Sox, which was the uh, pro baseball team that that used to play over at uh, Bill Maher Stadium in East Knoxville, and uh, uh, Knox Sox was uh, it was it was integrated at that time. They had uh, they had uh, a few black players, and, uh, so that was they actually uh, were integrated before uh, UT's uh, uh, ball team was. I went, my dad as a kid would take me to the Smokies baseball games. Mm -hmm. And he, my dad was a great baseball fan. Uh, matter of fact, uh, he took me, gosh, I must have been nine or 10 years old to Cincinnati to see the Brooklyn Dodgers play the Cincinnati Reds. Mm -hmm. And an interesting comment about baseball. Uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers trained in Vero Beach, Florida. That's where they did their spring training. And all, of course, all the baseball teams were east of the Mississippi River. There was nothing west uh, of the Mississippi. And when they broke spring training, they would come north and they would play exhibition games along the way. This being back in the 50s, the white players would stay at either the Farragut Hotel or the Andrew Johnson Hotel. And the black players, they had what they called tourist homes. Uh, these were large houses uh, where they rented out rooms for people uh, staying, which is where the uh, ball players, the black ball players would stay. I delivered the Knoxville New Sentinel. I was a paper carrier and my route was down Church Street. And uh, these uh, these houses were their own church or just off church and on my paper route. And so I had, uh, I got a baseball then. I have no idea what, it, well, I do know what happened to it, but it was autographed by the likes of Jackie Robinson and Don Newcomb, Roy Campanella. Yeah. 
not having understanding of how valuable that was, uh, then we take that baseball and me and the guys on the street and we play ball in the backyard until we beat the cover off of it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the audience, you, you don't remember the, uh, there were some in the 40s, especially in early 50s, there were some Negro League games oh, yes. at, at, uh, at, at Caswell Park there. And that, that was, uh, and, and there were big, big, big name people like, like your time. Hank Aaron was there. And, uh, oh, yes. and yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and some, went of the, some of those. I yeah, definitely yeah, went yeah, to some yeah, Indianapolis yeah. clowns and yeah. uh, Birmingham black barons. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, next one. Um, yeah, here's here's Gay Street. Uh, right when the Bijou uh, ceased its career as a porn theater, uh, it, it was a, a, a porn movie theater for about nine years. And they were, were talking about tearing it down because I think people were just embarrassed about it. And uh, people were set forward and said, you know, that there's still a nice theater in there. Why don't we save it? And I'm, I, I'm glad to say they I, did. I wrote a column about that, uh, gosh, way back then. This was <laughs> after Deep Throat had played uh, there uh -huh. at the Bijou. Uh -huh. The property was owned by the United Methodist Church. <laughs> and I wrote a column. <laughs> <laughs> that was ironic, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. During that time, yeah, I think the church owned it, but somebody had a lease, and they couldn't they couldn't yes. change what was being uh, being shown there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But they profited from uh, the rent. Yes. During that time. That's what. I, that, which was what I pointed out, uh, <laughs> both from the collection plate on Sunday morning and from watching Deep Throat on Saturday night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's an old blue circle hamburger place in the background there. Yes, right there at the corner of uh, Church and Gay. Yeah. And then just, just this side of that, a woman had a popcorn kiosk uh, that abutted uh, that building where a blue circle was. I've heard people talk about David Madden, the novelist, talks about her. They said she was kind of mean, but uh, the one that she remembered, he remembered, at least or maybe she was just mean to him, but... I never had that experience. <laughs> uh, nice one. Yeah, this is over in Bearden. Uh, we found this when we were researching the Bearden book. Uh, and of course, the Capri Cinema is uh, it's a sign for Rocky uh, in the 70s. And, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the Capri is over to the left. The cinema is actually over to the left of that building. Mm -hmm. the, the picture of it there. But that's now the... Uh, Oh, the, the art gallery uh, there is, it's, the building is still there. Next one, I used to work at the, at the Shoney's just for a few weeks. That was one of the worst jobs of my life. And I worked as a fry cook. Next one. Yeah, here's uh, downtown. This is the old uh, fire hall and it was torn down uh, for the construction of Summit Hill Drive during mm. the Al Testerman administration. And, uh, and the irony about this is that it, they got their uh, their uh, approval to uh, join the National Register of Historic Places about uh, uh, five or six days after it was actually demolished. Um, mm. But that's, uh, that was built uh, in 1901 or so. It was uh, uh, our first uh, freestanding uh, fire hall. One of the fire halls that I best remember was in East Knoxville. This was back when, um, uh, gosh, what was it? Uh, George Dempster was mayor, mm -hmm. and uh, they established this. Well, this fire hall was already there, but the city hired some black firemen, and that was where they were located. And uh, it was the drop point uh, for uh, the new Sentinel for the carriers to pick up their papers. Yeah. There were four of us. One carried Vine Street, another carried uh, Clinch. I carried Church Street and uh, another kid, oh, that, was a, that was a street between Church and Payne, Payne Avenue. Uh, we pick our papers up at that fire station and had a chance to meet and talk with a number of those firemen. And they had that brass pole, uh, they mm -hmm. sleep, their sleeping quarters was upstairs and uh, they would uh, get a call, they hit that pole and, uh, come sliding down and take off. Yeah, a point of great pride in our community. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
All right, next one, Paul. Okay, here's uh, back to the World's Fair, the LNN, LNN station, which had been empty since 1968 when they uh, when they began planning the fair. Uh, and this is when it, I think probably were hardly any prospects for it when Ross Mall took this picture. Uh, and you can see in the left one, the old uh, LNN hotel in the background, which actually was eventually torn down. I think it was the only historic building that was torn down uh, during the fair, but uh, or after after the fair actually. Um, but the LNN is now the the STEM Academy, and I can't think of a better use for that old building if you can't use it for train station. It's a it's a wonderfully <laughs> renovated uh, uh, building, and, and uh, I wish more people could see it. But it's uh, inside and out has been well well done and well used. One of the aspects, one of the aspects about the LNN, it was built uh, in the Jim Crow era. Yeah. There were three waiting rooms in there. The most ornate one was the one for white women. Mm -hmm. Then the next one was the general waiting room for white people. And then the one that was more like a hole in the wall was the one for black passengers. I wrote a number of times out of that as a kid going down to Atlanta on my way to spend some time with an aunt and then later to go on down to my maternal grandmother's uh, home in Georgia, uh, in Lincoln, Georgia. Yeah, well, well, thanks for sharing that. All right, next one, Paul. All right, here's nearby the old, uh, it says House House and Hardware Company. I, I don't know how many people recognize that, but that is uh, what we know as the foundry today. And uh, and that that's the original purpose that served. It was built very soon after the Civil War by uh, and, and was run by a former Union uh, veteran. Uh, it was an iron, an iron company, and this was their nail factory of a large complex, the Knoxville Iron Company, and that eventually moved to Lonsdale and uh, kind of evolved into a steel mill, which is still there today. Uh, so it's got quite a, a history with that connected to that old building. You know, talking um, about the, talking about the foundry, Bruce Wheeler, uh, whom I'm s absolutely certain that you know, Jack. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah he well. talked about uh, well back in what 19 around 1900, 1910 that uh, Knoxville, the great manufacturing uh, center uh, in the yeah. South, yeah. Uh, cotton, uh, iron, uh, foundry type uh, things. And what happened, and, and uh, these places hired uh, anybody and everybody, black people, white people paid them the same salary. But then how they had this big population boom in Sevier County and property had to be subdivided so many times uh, as far as raising crops or doing anything uh, with that, uh, that it, it, it could not support economically uh, the families that were living in there. So there was a, a spillover from there into Knox County. And uh, uh, these folk came out of Sevier County and they would go to a place like Knoxville Foundry and say, you've got these uh, uh, colored people working here. I need a job. And black folks started getting laid off uh, in places. And there was an exodus from Knoxville as far as this black population. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the iron company, uh, we know Mechanicsville today, which is, mm -hmm. it, it was a mixed race uh, neighborhood 150 years ago. They were, it was named for the mechanics who worked in the Knoxville Iron Company. Uh, and that was, and it's hard to picture now, but it, it's very close. This is actually very close to Mechanicsville and you could easily walk there uh, from mm -hmm. there if the uh, interstate wasn't there anymore. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a shame how things got worse than before they got better in many ways uh, over the years. So you see that over and over in, in Knoxville history. And now there are certain people in our society who want to put it in reverse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next one, Paul. All right, and we're back to the World's Fair. Uh, and uh, we looked at this picture earlier. I'm glad we uh, found this uh, this this yes, uh, brochure yeah. from, from that time. As I had forgotten all about uh, that newsletter that we used to send out uh, to the Black community in terms of what was going on. But yes, 
Mm -hmm. Brings back memories. Yeah. All right. 